Hello and welcome to the Core Service Review. Uh, my name is Corey. Uh, I will be a true narrator. Uh, unlike some of the other presentations that, uh, that we have for online courses, there will not be a lot of embellishing on this course. For the most part, I will be a narrator, a guide to take you through this, and I will be reading almost verbatim uh, off of these slides because some people have a difficulty reading and, and quite frankly that's one of the hindrances that we have in, in learning. So we want to make this test uh, as, as slick as possible for you so not only do we want to present the material for you to study from uh, and give you a good base uh, of understanding of what we're talking about but we also want to make sure that you actually can read the material that's on the slides which again uh, is sometimes a hindrance. So. Um, if it gets to be uh, a, a little bit long for you, pause it. Uh, if you miss something, rewind it. Uh, the idea behind this presentation is not timing. Uh, so we're not going to make you sit here for a timed amount of time and, and, and then you're done. You'll be able to go forward and backward and review this material for 30 days uh, beyond your, your initiation, but on this registration. So uh, I truly want to make sure that passing the test is, uh, you know, as slick as possible, and and I don't want to have any kind of um, semblance as to me having inside information as to exactly what's on the test. That bank uh, of questions for these tests are thousands and thousands of questions wide. So you have a huge pool of questions you can draw for. Uh, our goal here. Uh, in this presentation is to do the best job that we can with somebody that has a good firm understanding of the, of the industry uh, and narrow down uh, some of the different areas that are talked about in uh, the actual uh, core uh, test. And, and keep in mind, the core test covers all areas of the industry. It's not narrowed down to just HVAC or just refrigerants. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things in this um, uh, this part of the test. And I wouldn't be doing the industry justice, I wouldn't be doing this presentation justice if I didn't take just a minute and say, look, um, I'm not the one that come up with all of this material. Uh, all of these uh, calculations and angles and such. They're, they're a collaboration of lots of great minds in the industry and I want to take just a second and I want to thank them and acknowledge them for their input into this presentation. We, we've all got downsides and in, in areas that we need help with uh, just like you do and these organizations and individuals that I'm going to talk about they have been a huge bright spot for the industry. So I'm going to go ahead and start out with some acknowledgments. We'd like to thank and recognize that this information has been derived from decades of experience and testing made by many different organizations in the HVACR industry as well as ourselves. These organizations include but certainly are not limited to ASHRAE, ACCA, HACA, PHCC, ABC, and a couple of dear friends of mine, Big John Segerson and Dave Sweat. And of course the list goes on and on. We wouldn't be where we are today as an industry without their understanding the need uh, for, uh, of the need for verifying what we know through testing. If you're not verifying things through tests, everything is only a guess. Their time efforts, technical expertise, professionalism, and financial contributions to the industry that I personally love have significantly added to the exceptional quality of this presentation. Let's get into heat transfer and comfort. When it comes to heat transfer and comfort, there are a couple of different sub areas inside of that. We've got temperature and humidity measurement, total comfort and basic science. So let's look at the first one, temperature and humidity measurement. First thing we come to is sensible heat. Sensible heat is heat that can be sensed. It can be felt. 
It can be felt and measured. And it's measured with a dry bulb thermometer. Okay, which might be a little bit counter uh, intuitive to those of you modern day guys that are doing a lot of stuff with wet bulb. Latent heats, a little bit different. It's heat that's hidden. Can't be felt or measured. And occurs during the phase change of a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a vapor or the reverse. Question. The type of heat that must be added or removed to cause a change in the physical state of a substance is what? Doom, 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 doom. Ba -da -ba. Did you get it? Sensible heat. Enthalpy. Enthalpy is used to indicate the total heat energy contained in a substance. Enthalpy includes both the sensible heat and the latent heat. And enthalpy is usually measured with a wet bulb thermometer. Relative humidity. If the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature are known, the relative humidity can be determined. Relative humidity is a ratio of the amount of moisture present in the air to the amount it can hold at saturation, which is 100%. This is a liquid column thermometer that measures dry bulb temperature. This is a mechanical thermometer that measures dry bulb temperature. A sling psychrometer can measure the dry and wet bulb and then the relative humidity percentage can be determined. Many of you have used a sling psychrometer. Some of you have moved a little bit further on than that to a digital psychrometer. Notice the two thermometers. The one on the left has nothing on its sensing bulb. It's the dry bulb or DB. The bulb on the right has a sock that is wet. It is the wet bulb or WB. There are other ways that you can make a wet bulb out in the field. You can take a pocket thermometer and a small section of shoelace, cut the little uh, plastic or tip off the end, get it damp and wring it out, and usually they're hollow. And you can slide your pocket thermometer right through the center of it. And you'll make a uh, wet bulb thermometer similar to what you see. Did you notice the use of the two glass, the liquid column, thermometers? Glass thermometers are more accurate than mechanical thermometers. Here's an example of an electronic thermometer. It's capable of dry bulb, wet bulb, and the percent relative humidity. And this is what I was talking about just a moment ago in being a digital psychrometer. Name the three methods of heat transfer and how they transfer heat. How about conduction? Heat transfer through solids from one molecule to, the, to another. I always liken that to throwing a mouse out in the crowd in the middle of a crowd of people. You don't have to know where the mouse is, but the middle people agitate the people next to them, who agitate the people next to them, who agitate the people next to them. It's the reason that you can hold a piece of metal in your hand and have a lighter on the other side of the piece of metal, not at the same spot you're holding on to, but eventually if the metal is fairly short, uh, the area that you're heating will transfer that heat all the way down to where you're holding on to it. It's the heat transfer through solids from one molecule to another. Then there's convection. Heat transfer through a liquid, or, well, liquid, a fluid medium, water 
or air, radiation, heat transfer by wave, electromagnetic waves. Now, when we look at convection, convection sometimes is overcomplicated in our industry. If you're having trouble trying to wrap your noodle around what we're talking about with convection, it says the heat transfer through a fluid medium. Okay? Here where our examples are water and air. Just think about that. Heat transfer with convection. Hot air rises, cold air falls. Hotter water rises, cooler water falls. That is your normal convection. Your churning of that air um, is what they're talking about there. Radiation, one of the keys to radiation is radiation um, has the radiant heat waves that heat up the stuff, not the air in between. Uh, some people will liken it to the sun heating up to the earth. Uh, but one of the ways that I always look at uh, radiation, I look at a warehouse with radiant tube heaters and you move that deflector that's on top of those to point towards where the people are going to be. Because usually in a warehouse it would be much more cost efficient if you could just heat the people in their space without heating all the air in between and, and usually that's impossible any other way. With a forced air medium you've got to heat the whole space in order to heat any of the space. So uh, with radiant waves you can direct those radiant waves onto the people and literally if you're on the, on the edge of where that deflector goes you'll be able to feel cool outside of that deflector's range and warm where those radiant waves are hitting you. So it's a very, very efficient way to heat larger areas. Uh, you'll see patio heaters uh, uh, at bars and, and things like that outside. Uh, radiant heat is great in those settings because radiant waves heat stuff and people. They don't heat the air in between, so if you've got a little bit of wind, um, it doesn't make any difference. BTU. A BTU defined as the amount of heat that must be added to one pound of water to raise its temperature one degree Fahrenheit. And what does BTU stand for? British Thermal Unit. A BTU is really a measurement of the quantity of heat in a substance. Now why do we go over stuff like this where we're talking about uh, uh, definitions and such? Well, because these definitions have a very good likelihood of actually being on the test. So it's important to pay attention to many of these definitions. Um, don't overlook them. BTU, practical application. The BTU is useful in determining how much heat to add or remove from a building for heating and cooling comfort. Or how much heat to remove from a freezer so that the product remains at a specified temperature. Name the three states of matter. Solids, liquids, gases. The two properties of matter are temperature or heat intensity and BTUs which are the quantity or how much. Dew point. Dew point is the temperature at which the water vapor in the air becomes saturated 100 percent relative humidity and starts to condense into water droplets. Now we're going to move into total comfort. Total comfort is most often thought of in terms of dry bulb temperature, but that's only one small part because it also includes the following temperature dry bulb, humidity wet bulb, 
indoor air quality, sound, and each person's activity level, age, and physiology. See, now a lot of people leave that out. If you've got a room with several people in it, people give off BTUs. So if those BTUs are overcoming what your heating and cooling is, then the room is naturally going to feel stifled and uncomfortable. Dry bulb temperature. Temperature uniformity may not be achieved if a building is served by a single thermostat. Temperature stratification may be overcome by proper mixing of the air by the ventilation system. Commonly this is why you'll see even residentially people will have their fan position switched to on instead of just auto so that way it circulates air even when the heating and cooling device is not even uh, calling for it. Uninsulated floors over heated spaces can lead to discomfort. A thermostat with a wide quote unquote dead band will cause large fluctuations of indoor temperature. Wet bulb. Increase in humidity. It's going to reduce the ability to lose heat through perspiration and evaporation. It's similar to raising the temperature and it can promote the growth of mold and mildew. So obviously it's a fine line in humidity and temperature in a home and how they interact together and how they uh, need to be controlled and moderated. A decrease in humidity, however, increases the ability to lose heat through perspiration and evaporation. It's similar to lowering the temperature and it may also cause some discomfort, uh, especially in the winter months when you're dealing with static electricity. Oftentimes, if you'll remember, in order to reduce the static electric shocks in the wintertime, what we're doing is we're adding a humidifier so that the humidity in the air helps keep that static from building up on the skin. Applications for humidity. Moisture is introduced into a space with the use of a humidifier that's designed to operate with the heating system. I think they call it a sprinkler when there's no heating system to go with the water. Yeah, just a joke. The different types of humidifiers include a pan type, slightly outdated, a wetted element type, starting to get more common, and the atomizing type and more recently to go along with the atomizing type you could also stick in the steam type. See if you remember what those are. Pan type, the wetted element type, the atomizing type and then could potentially even go further and say the steam type. The bypass type of humidifier functions by allowing a percentage of the warm air supply to pass through the humidifier and pick up moisture on its way to the return air plenum, thus the name bypass. Looking at this, you can see in the application we've got a humidifier hooked up and the humidifier is hooked up on the supply side. Uh, this is a bit of a primitive view of how this, uh, this all looks, however you get the point. There is humidifier on the supply side and there's an opening on the return side and warm air pipe going between those two with a damper uh, in, in the middle there someplace to control uh, the air going from one side to the other. And then also that aids in shutting it off during the summertime when you're no longer needing it. Total comfort. Total comfort uh, is dealing with indoor air quality and it's affected by ventilation, cleaning the air, and odor control. <clears throat> 
indoor air quality dealing with ventilation. Some commercial air handling units distribute a blend of outdoor air and recirculated indoor air. Now think about that uh, with the ventilation. There are some applications where that's going to work just great. Think about a shopping mall in the middle of the winter uh, when you're using what they call an economizer uh, so that you're able to utilize the cold air that's outside in order to keep a proper amount of fresh air coming in um, while not making the the customers overwhelmed with cold air or hot air uh, because you're mixing it coming from the outside and there's not a lot of humidity that's going to be contained in that outdoor air. Air distribution. The movement of air within the space must be accomplished without objectionable drafts and noise levels. Very important. Uh, nothing annoys a customer more than having a noise in their system. The quiet, comfortable movement of air is accomplished only with proper duct design. This includes the correct amount of CFM from the blower and distribution of air from grills and diffusers with minimal noise. But residential systems can contribute to the IAQ uh, problems due to lack of outdoor air. You think about that. Houses are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Windows are getting better. Um, as a mainstream, as a society, we're learning more and more about sealing up our house and, and utilizing things more efficiently and such. In, uh, insulation is keeping things out. We're Tyvek wrapping all these houses. So there's not a lot of fresh air coming into a home, yet oftentimes especially uh, if you got an older style furnace or a single piped furnace you're burning the air from the from the home and then exhausting it back outside so uh, you're not bringing in enough air to replace that. Uh, one of the things uh, that may or may not be on this test or other tests uh, but it is a good thing to know if you're exhausting air out of a home because you're burning air from the room that the furnace sits in such as on a single pipe furnace uh, an 80% style or power vented water heater uh, you're going to have to bring in enough air to replace what it's exhausting out of the home while it's burning uh, and the fuel gas code calls that the standard calculation method and that method is 50 cubic feet of air per thousand BTUs per hour of the input BTUs on all the appliances that are going to be served by this device. So that's no joke. That's a lot of air that has to be replaced and you can be one of those uh, uh, folks out there that say, well, this house is leaky, it's drafty, uh, there's plenty of air coming back in after I'm exhausting it. Uh, but if you're really honest with yourself, you're not bringing in nearly enough air to replace the air that you're exhausting. And even if you are, think about that. You're exhausting the air out of the home that you just heated up and oh, and, and, and it's going to have to come in from someplace else. And if you're not controlling how it comes in, then that means it's coming in willy-nilly through the cracks and crevices and under doors and stuff like that. So it's coming in untempered. So it's not heated, it's not cooled, it's not properly uh, you know, dehumidified or humidified, however you're looking at that. It's got allergens in it. So none of that stuff is controlled uh, so really, uh, your air distribution is, is huge, uh, and it's not just, uh, you know, in the wintertime, also in the summertime. Uh, air cleaning. Air filtration is imperative to an HVAC system's ability to deliver quality air. Filters come in a wide range of designs. We've seen a lot of those designs. They've got the lower efficiency filters, which are the throwaway style. We've seen those. We've used those. In fact, uh, when you look at the efficiency rating on most of these appliances, their their efficiency rating is achieved by using some of these lower efficiency filters. Extended surface or pleated filters. Keep in mind, the more efficient the filter is, the more stuff it will catch, the more restrictive it is on the airflow. So the more you're going to restrict the functionality of your device. 
electronic filters without increased pressure drop across the filter uh, and that's that's important uh, the electronic filters there are some out there that can be extremely restrictive but the idea is to stick this device in there that's going to be able to zap and uh, um, get rid of all of these small micro particles without adding to the pressure drop across that filter without being restrictive in the system and electrostatic filters. Odor control. Now, this is everybody's favorite. There's nothing worse than being called out on a service call for a customer that has a smell. So, odors and contaminants take many forms in a building. One technique is to dilute them with outdoor air. Bring in so much fresh air and exhaust so much building air uh, that the odor virtually is diluted to the point to where it's barely detectable. Another technique is to isolate the odors and contaminants. Well, isolate them to a, a confined space uh, or certain area. And one other technique would be the use of a local exhaust. You know, exhausting only out of that one particular area so that you're getting rid of the odors. Now obviously none of these address the actual problem. The The most straightforward way to uh, to deal with odor control is to take away whatever's causing the odor and that's not brought out in this presentation because that should be self-evident. That should be common sense uh, and oftentimes taking these tests common sense is a big part of what you're doing. total comfort. When dealing with sound that can be equally as taxing on a service guy as dealing with a smell. So we want to treat them both uh, tenderly because they mean a lot to a customer but at the same token you need to go into it realizing that you may not ha hear the same sound that the customer hears. And it's, it's oftentimes very frustrating to them but it's also very frustrating to us and we need to make sure and keep uh, keep our own uh, feelings and frustrations under wraps as being the professionals so dealing with sound the human ear can tolerate a low frequency without annoyance much better than a high frequency and think about it uh, even though somebody that drives by in a car with a lot of bass which is low frequency uh, might be annoying to you uh, it's not taxing on your ears other than you don't like the music however if you're in a car with squealing uh, steelheart 80s hairband uh, music with a high pitched frequency uh, and you turn it up too high, that's going to probably be uncomfortable and for some people going to be painful. When sound becomes a problem, it's considered a noise. And we've got to locate and eliminate this noise for the customer um, to be able to achieve their comfort. Generally, ductwork's going to attenuate okay, or reduce unit sound level. And oftentimes we're putting Kevlar um, connectors on there that will, that will further help uh, in that whole process. Occasionally though, sound generated by poorly constructed elbows or high air velocity through the grills and diffusers can be greater than that of the unit. Untreated sheet metal is going to absorb acoustical energy uh, like no other. Uh, oftentimes if you're down in a basement and you're doing an install and somebody's got the furnace pulled out from under the plenum and the coil removed and all that kind of good stuff it's like having a bullhorn to the rest of the house anything you say down in that basement is going to be carried to every room of the house and we've all experienced that so if it's an untreated type of sheet metal uh, it's going to be incredibly uh, uh, likely 
that you're going to be able to have much more sound transfer uh, throughout the home. Absorption doubles if the duct wall has exterior insulation. Internally lined ductwork attenuation is caused by the sound wave impinging on the surfaces of the porous material. Thin materials will attenuate only the higher frequencies effectively. Very thick and dense materials are required to attenuate low frequencies. And grill noise is primarily a function of its design and the face velocity. When you try to push too much air through a grill, it's going to make a noise. Mechanical vibration, we've dealt with that a ton, oftentimes in commercial, light commercial and industrial applications. It's imperative that mechanical equipment be isolated properly. In addition to proper isolation, use a flexible pipe flexible duct connections and isolation of pipe hangers is recommended. Some sound advice, good one, right? Some sound advice. We need to consider the tolerance level of the people who will use the room. Are they finicky? Uh, are they sensitive to any noise? Uh, you know, and, and being sensitive to noise could you know, could come down to what are they going to use the room for? Okay, such as um, if you're going to be in a room that requires testing, noise could be an, ex uh, an extremely annoying thing. Uh, but most people are going to accept, uh, without complaining, a higher noise level in offices than they will in the library or the church. Uh, and the noise level in their home is also going to be uh, somewhat annoying to them. Less tolerance there. Some basic science will deal with chemistry, some physical measurements, and mechanics. Chemistry basics. Matter is a substance, much like water. Molecules are the smallest particle of a substance that has the properties of that substance. Elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances. And atoms are the smallest particle of an element. Combustion is a chemical process that requires fuel, oxygen, and heat. Uh, if you've been to any combustion analysis class, you understand that. Chemicals react with each other to either produce complete or incomplete combustion. Complete combustion occurs when all the fuel is oxidized. Incomplete combustion produces carbon monoxide. Weight is a measure of the force of gravity. Density is a measure of weight per cubic volume. Specific gravity is the density of a, of a substance compared to the density of water and air has a specific gravity of 1. A couple of the other fuels we use, natural gas, a specific gravity of 0.6, and propane, roughly specific gravity of 1.52. Now what do those figures tell you? Well that tells you as opposed to air, natural gas is lighter than air, and propane is heavier than air. So propane could pool in an area, uh, thus the name for, or need for uh, uh, alarms and evacuation systems and things like that uh, for the propane, some of the, which has different uh, combustive qualities. Mechanics. 
Boyle's Law. What is Boyle's Law? The volume of a gas varies inversely with the absolute pressure, provided the temperature remains constant. In other words, as the pressure increases, the volume decreases, and as the pressure decreases, the volume increases. Charles Law. The volume of a gas varies directly as to the absolute temperature, provided that the pressure remains constant. In other words, as a gas heats, it expands. As a gas cools, it contracts. Dalton's Law. The total pressure of a confined mixture of gases is the sum or equal to of the pressures of each of the gases in the mixture. Remember, anytime you see sum, that means equal. You're adding. For example, if there's a container with oxygen at 30 psig in it and a separate container with nitrogen at 40 psig, when we put the two in one container, the pressure will become 70 psig. So Dalton's law is additive with pressures. Temperature is measured in units of Fahrenheit or Celsius. The absolute temperatures are Rankine and Kelvin. Which absolute scale is associated with Fahrenheit and Celsius? Any guesses? Okay, well, I'll just tell you. When it comes to Fahrenheit and Celsius, obviously those are two very different measurements um, for temperature and Rankin is the equivalent to Fahrenheit and Celsius is the equivalent to Kelvin. So there are your associations uh, for those two. Physical measurements. Atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 psi. Gauge pressure is used to measure the pressure in a container or system, but it uses atmospheric pressure as a reference. One horsepower equals 746 watts. One ton of refrigeration is equal to 12,000 BTUs per hour. One watt of electricity equals 3.412 BTUs. So one kilowatt or KW equals 3,412 BTUs just as a reference. Electrical. Basic electricity, AC motors, electrical diagrams, and electrical meters will all be covered in this next section. Okay, remember, and this isn't going to get into the nitty-gritty of all of the different intricacies. This is an overview to aid you or guide you down the course of what you should be studying for for the NATE exam. Electrons and electricity. 
Matter is composed of atoms. Atoms have several parts. We've got the nucleus, which has protons and neutrons. Uh, the protons are considered positively charged, and the neutrons are considered a neutral charge. And then, of course, we've got electrons, which have a negative charge. Atoms have that, uh, that have an equal number of electrons and protons, positive and negative charge, are considered neutral. Atoms can lose or gain electrons, which is why we get static zapped. Uh, as you're shuffling across the carpet and uh, you, you shock somebody, oftentimes we don't think about what actually took place there. Uh, when you're rubbing something together, that is highly conductive, like copper. Well, uh, as soon as you stop rubbing them together, you pull them apart, well, the electrons quickly go back to where they were because they can do that very easily on a conductive type of metal or surface. However, if you take something that's not very conductive, even closer to the insulative side, like a pair of slippers across a carpet, and you shuffle those along, well, the electrons may transfer from one to the other, but they don't go back right away because there's not a lot of good conductivity there between those two uh, surfaces. So what happens is you have a buildup of electrons on one surface or the other, usually going to be on our slippers, which charges our body. And then, of course, you come over to a person uh, and you zap them, or you go to uh, a doorknob and you go to open up the door and you zap yourself because now you've got a good conductive surface for those uh, electrons to discharge onto to equalize the charge between the two the two areas. An atom is positively charged if it loses electrons. Okay, keep this all in mind. Uh, this is something that if you get this down now, it'll be very easy to remember, uh, not only for the purpose of taking the test, but uh, you know, in your everyday life as a service technician, as an installer, as a salesperson, electricity uh, is kind of a fickle subject. And if you're not a true electrician, you don't deal with it every day, uh, some of the things can be a little bit like magic, kind of like the refrigeration process inside of the line set for somebody that doesn't do that every day. Uh, it's stuff you have to know, but you can't necessarily uh, see it. And this is one of those things. Things become positively charged because they lose electrons. It can be negatively charged if it gains electrons. Uh, notice here there's no talk of losing or gaining uh, protons. That's because what actually moves in this whole process is the electrons. They're lighter, they move quicker, and their idea is to, to get to where they can and keep on moving. An atom that is neither positively or negatively charged is called an ion. An unstable atom is not neutral. Electrons of unstable atoms flow from atom to atom in an attempt to make the atom stable. Okay? We, uh, uh, we deal with this in some of the electrical classes, and, and if you're not understanding what I'm talking about, don't feel alone. Okay? This, isn't, uh, this isn't a lot of easy stuff to grasp. Um, the whole idea of these electrons moving from atom to atom, trying to make that atom stable, goes clear back to uh, life science and, and dealing with valence electrons, which is that outer shell of atoms. The valence electrons are supposed to be uh, stable at eight valence electrons or eight in the outer shell. And if there's any less than that, uh, depending on how many less, um, other atoms will lose or gain uh, their electrons trying to make that outer shell uh, happen and that's how we get some of these um, different combinations like oh copper oxide or aluminum oxide some things we deal with every day uh, you got just regular old oxygen meeting up with copper or aluminum 
and they're trying to balance each other out and together they make a very stable bond. Electricity is the flow of these electrons. A conductor is a material which passes electrons easily. Some good conductors would be gold, silver, and copper. Uh, when you look at these three particular uh, conductors, uh, one stands out, gold, uh, as being a little bit odd. But the reason that they use gold in some of these, uh, these conductors, like uh, for instance, a good example would be monster cables. Monster cables are known uh, for having great uh, signal transfer and such. Well, gold on the actual connection points where it meets with this data sensitive um, circuitry is going to be something that, that one, is going to make the cable expensive, but two, is also going to make it highly effective in transferring signals and data and things like that because gold does not oxidize. So gold is not going to make that same formation um, of oxidation and have that chalky white buildup and such like copper would or aluminum would. It takes a very, very small amount of that uh, to stop the, the flow of data uh, or signal transfer. So gold is optimal in those, those scenarios. You can see them in cell phones, monster cables, things like that. Data sensitive connections. An insulator is a material which does not pass electrons easily. Doesn't say at all. It says easily. Some poor conductors would be glass, rubber, and wood. Production of electricity. Electricity or the flow of electrons can be accomplished by several means, three of which are mentioned here. Friction, which produces static electricity. Rubbing things together is basically what we're talking about there. If we rub two um, non-conductive devices together, oftentimes they're going to build up a little bit of static. Chemical, which produces electricity from a battery. And magnetic or magnetoelectricity, which produces electricity from a generator. Magnetic production of electricity. When a conductor moves through the flux lines of a magnet, electrons will flow in the conductor, thus the production of electricity. And I'm going to show you a little bit better picture of this uh, coming up next, and maybe it'll help, uh, help it sink in just a little bit. This is a much better picture. Uh, this particular picture is courtesy Mike Holt uh, Enterprises, which I do do electrical training uh, with uh, presentation material provided by that, uh, that organization. And they are the first and foremost uh, on anything electrical. And if you see the difference in this diagram and the one you just looked at, uh, you'll understand how much more anatomically correct this is. And you can see up in the upper left uh, where it says north and south and then it says one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, all the way across the top of the screen. And you follow how the two little dots, the one black and the one shaded gray, actually circle inside of the north and south poles all the way across the top of the screen. And you follow that sine wave down below, which is what we call alternating current you'll understand that uh, you're not going to be able to pull a horseshoe magnet along a wire and have any, you know, <laughs> good luck creating uh, electricity. However, in this particular uh, scenario where we've actually got something rotating, we have a much better um, area environment uh, to be producing electricity where we've got a rotating magnet, we've got a wire somewhere in there, and because of our opposing uh, magnetic fields there, we're gonna be generating uh, power. Basic electrical terms. Electricity has three components. They are 
current, which is the flow of electrons, what, uh, what is the symbol of current? It's the big A, amps. Voltage, the push or the pressure that moves the electrons, symbolized by, by the uh, V symbol. And resistance, the opposition to electrical flow, symbolized by the resistance omega uh, symbol, or the word ohms. Current can also be uh, typified by the letter I. It's measured in amps and the letter I stands for intensity. Voltage identified by the letter E as well and it's measured in volts. It's also known as the EMF or electromotive force and referred to as potential difference. So if you look at those two um, all by themselves. Notice that in the last slide, when talking about current and voltage, I said they can be typified by the letter A or the word amps on your meter. Uh, and I said voltage could be typified by the letter V. Well here they're saying current is I and voltage is E. That is what happens when you get closer to being an electrician then you are a mechanical guy. The closer you get to be an electrician or studying the electrical field, the closer you get to using proper terminology. This is the difference between what's common slang term uh, and usually on our mechanical meters, uh, such as the V and the, and the word amps or A, and what's actually on uh, an electrician's meter or the way that they talk. Uh, which is current being I and voltage uh, being E. Resistance could be identified by the letter R and it's measured in ohms and the symbol for ohms is the Greek letter omega as I was stating in the last slide. Direct current circuits DC circuits. A simple circuit consists of three main components. A power source, usually a battery. A path, which could be a wire that carries the electrons. And a load, or a device that consumes the current. A switch is not required. We often put them in circuits so that we can control the circuit, turn it on and off, uh, or vary the intensity a little bit. Direct current circuits also involve laws. We talked about Dalton's law and Boyle's law and things like that earlier. Now we're talking about Ohm's law. Ohm's law can be used to determine volts, amps, and resistance so long as any two of the three variables are known. This is what I call a formula wheel. And in a formula wheel, the way that you figure out the answer that you're looking for is by simply covering up what you don't know. So if I was looking for voltage, I would be looking for the E or electromotive force so I would simply cover that up. What, what I'm left with is I and R. When you go straight across the, the formula on a wheel, it's multiplication. When you go up and down, it's division. So if I cover up the E, E equals I times R. So my volts would equal amps times resistance. If you look at the example that's given here, which is resistance, if you cover, that means we're looking for resistance. If you cover up the R in the wheel, it leaves you with E and I. And anytime one is over another, it is division. So notice in the example, R 
or resistance equals volts or E divided by amps or I. Shown below is a DC circuit that has a red positive connection and a black negative connection. The meter that's being used here is polarized because its red lead is connected to the positive side and its black lead is connected to the negative side. When HVACR equipment has a DC circuit, the meter must be polarized to test the circuit. Alternating currents. As the moving conductor rotates through the flux lines, electrons flow in one direction and then in the opposite direction. This was typified in the design that we looked at earlier that you may want to flip back to with the rotating uh, polarized areas inside of the north and south uh, poles a couple of slides back. This flow of current in both directions is called alternating current and is represented by a sine wave. Looks like that. Shown is one cycle but alternating current has a frequency of 60 Hertz or 60 cycles per second. Circuit analysis. A sine wave starts at zero, then rises to a peak, then drops off to zero, then rises to a peak value in the opposite direction, then drops off to zero. There's also a peak to peak value to the voltage, but that is not what, uh, what's used in AC circuits. Instead, there's a value that is lower than the peak and is known as the RMS or root mean square value. Okay, that's basically what you're looking for is actual usable current when you're doing RMS. There are three, uh, three types of circuit designs in the HVACR industry. They are the series circuit, the parallel circuit, and the series parallel circuit. The series circuit. Uh, some people look at this uh, as being like Christmas lights. There's one path uh, for the current to travel down. Current is equal throughout the entire thing and the voltage drops at e each load the same as being additive. So the voltage drop across uh, each device that's in that circuit is equal to the total voltage drop of the circuit itself. <clears throat> so when you look at it, if the current is equal all the way through, uh, but you have a modern set of Christmas lights, what happens when one light starts to go out and then it goes out and the next one the next one and the next one why does it seem to be that when one goes out the rest of them don't follow too far behind well when you think about it if voltage drops at each load then that means each time a load is taken out of the circuit and isn't being used then that means the voltage increases some people will look at this and say, okay, well, how come on the old Christmas lights, when a light burns out, the whole, the whole string goes out? And you got to find out which light was burnt out in order to replace it so the string works again. Why doesn't that do that now? Well, now, 
It's not a parallel circuit in a lot of them. It still is a, a series circuit. However, many of the Christmas lights um, are designed in such a fashion that when a light burns out, it shunts across, which means it burns out in such a fashion that it makes a connection at the base that completes the circuit. And as long as you leave the burnt out light bulb in, the light, uh, light string will work fine. If you take it out, of course, you remove the shunt and the whole string will go out. So as that light burns out, though, it's not using uh, anything from the circuit. So the voltage goes up. And each time a light burns out, the voltage goes up a little bit more. And more that the voltage goes up, uh, the more likely you are to burn out additional lights quicker. A parallel circuit. There's more than one path uh, for the electricity to travel. The voltage is equal at each load. So this is different. The voltage dropped at each load in the series circuit. Now on the parallel circuit, the voltage is equal, but the current drops with each one. It's, it's split up between each one. I wouldn't say it drops with each one. It's split up between each one. So some of the current goes uh, through the first path. Some of it goes through the second path. Some of it goes through the third path. So if you wanted to find out how much current was on that circuit, you would measure the complete circuit, uh, which would be basically the, uh, the top left connection, the top right connection. If you wanted to check the, com uh, the current on each individual device, you'd have to check it uh, at each individual device. So the voltage stays the same throughout uh, and doesn't drop like it did on the series, but the current uh, is split up between the, the appliances. And they call it additive because if you were to add up the current on each of those appliances or each of those devices in that circuit, uh, the additive amount would be the, the total amount for the entire circuit. The series parallel circuit. The loads are current consuming devices and with few exceptions, are connected in parallel. The load controllers, or potentially switches, control the current flow to the load and with, again, few exceptions, are connected in series with the load. So that gives it the option to turn on and off individual sections of that parallel circuit without affecting the other parts of the circuit. And this could be pressure switches, temperature switches, uh, all kinds of different things that we could be looking at there. Electrical generation and distribution can be a complicated subject, but let's face it, we're not in an electrical class, so we're going to need to know the basics. We're not going to need to know how to build one. Single phase has only one winding, producing only one sine wave. Three phase has three windings, separated by 120 degrees, each producing its own sine wave. Generation and distribution uh, continued deals with voltage. The voltage between the two hot conductors in this particular scenario is going to be 240. The voltage between either hot conductor and neutral is 120. Notice that the neutral conductor is also connected to the earth ground and the NEC requires this conductor to be a green wire, a bare copper wire, or a green wire with yellow stripes. Okay, so when you're looking at this, you're looking at a winding, uh, which is all those little ripple th uh, things in the, the picture going vertical. And you've got your two hot wires are connected on each side of that vertical winding, and the neutral is connected dead, dead center in the middle and connected to the ground.
three phase AC power supply. There are three coils for a three phase AC power supply. That means there are six wires to be connected to the equipment. Two ways in which these six wires may be connected or configured are delta and y. Generation and distribution of a delta configuration is fairly straightforward. Notice it forms a triangle uh, pattern there and then also notice that your measurements from each of those legs, leg one, two, or three, to each other are going to equal 240 volts, so they're all the same. However, if you were to take each of those legs and measure them to the neutral, you're going to have a different measurement uh, from L1 uh, to neutral than you would L3 to neutral or L2 to neutral. Different length of winding between those. So that's where some of the uh, scariness gets, in, uh, gets involved. Uh, generation distribution on a Y configuration, as another example, if you go from L1 to L2 or L3, you're going to get the same amount there as well. You're going to get 208 volts. But what do you get from L3 to neutral, or L1 to neutral, or L2 to neutral? You should get the same value. So that's one of the ways to tell the difference between a Y and a delta configuration. Electrical loads and power. Electrical loads and power. Resistive loads convert electrons into heat. An example of a resistive load would be an electric heater or electric strips. Inductive loads involve a coil and a magnetic field. Examples of inductive loads would be a motor, a solenoid coil, and a transformer. Capacitive loads, on the other hand, involve a component known as a capacitor. A capacitor does not convert electrons into some other form of energy. They simply store the electrons and then, of course, release them. Power is composed of two variables, voltage and current. When we pay for power, we're paying for the combination of voltage times current. So therefore, power equals voltage times current. And we've seen the formula wheel earlier, which deals with Ohm's law, the same could be said of the newer uh, formula wheel that deals with the pi tar chart, which is P over I and E. Remember when figuring out power, power is going to give you an answer that's figured in watts. In order to figure out what you're actually going to pay, you have to convert that into kilowatts. Kilo uh, is thousands. So you have to change that into KW because that's what the uh, uh, municipalities are charging us for. Power is broken down into two types. True power, measured with a meter known as a watt meter, and apparent power, which is calculated uh, by measuring I times E. Power factor is a little bit different. It's a relationship between true power and the apparent power. When the E and the I, the volts and the amps, are in phase, the power factor is equal to 1, sometimes known as unity. A single phase 240 volt supply is connected to a motor. The ammeter indicates 8 amps. The data plate on the motor notes a 0.72 power factor. What will the watts indicated 
what will the watts be that are indicated on the watt meter? P power equals E times I times power factor. So volts times amps times power factor. 240 volts times 8 amps times 0.72 the power equals 1382 watts. Solid state electronics. Solid state makes reference to the, to the description of a component. Semiconductor is a reference to materials conductivity. So let's see if you can match column A with column B. Column A reads conductor, semiconductor, and insulator. Column B reads electrons do not flow easily through me as answer A. Answer B is electrons flow easily through me. And answer C is I am in between. Well, C should be the easiest one. If it's in between, it could be semi, right? Would be in between. So let's look at where these go. In between would be semiconductor. Electrons flow easily through me would be a conductor. Electrons do not flow easily through me would be an insulator. Diode, a simple electronic device that allows the current to flow in only one direction, which consequently, if you look at the diode symbol there, uh, it's an arrow with a little line at the tip of the arrow. Now, in a lot of instances, in just in life, common sense is going to tell you you're going to follow the arrow in the flow, but not so when we're talking about diodes. When we're talking about diodes in a diagram, uh, always remember that your flow is going to go against uh, your intuition, which is to follow the arrow. The flow is going to go backwards towards the arrow. It acts as an insulator and a conductor. It's a device with two leads, and they're called an anode and a cathode. The anode being positive, the cathode being negative. A rectifier is a diode that allows more electrons to flow. This device can be used to change AC to DC. A transistor is composed of P-type or N-type material, positive or neutral. It has three leads or terminals, a base, a collector, and an emitter kind of looks like a flex capacitor. It can be connected several different ways and may be used as a switch or an amplifier. A triac has two diodes in a single device. It can conduct on both halves of the AC waveform. It's used for switching AC applications. A thermistor. A thermistor is a resistor that is sensitive to temperature. It can either be a PTC or a NTC. A PTC, positive temperature coefficient thermistor, resistance increases with an increase in temperature. So resistance increases with an increase in temperature and resistance decreases with a decrease in temperature. Negative temperature coefficient or NTC is a thermistor that has resistance decreasing with an increase in the temperature. So the higher the temperature, the less the resistance and the resistance increases with a decrease in temperature. 
Several applications are temperature sensors and electronic thermostats, PTC kits for PSC motors and solid state relays. Solid state electronic components have become more and more common in the HVACR industry. They're being used in applications for safety and operation. However, be very cautious when using your own meter to test some solid state controls and control boards. The battery in the meter may potentially damage the components. AC motors, single phase. There are five uh, types of single phase motors. Listed here are lowest to highest torque. First, we've got the shaded pole, the lowest. Split phase motor, permanent split capacitor, capacitor start, induction run, capacitor start, capacitor run, which has your highest torque and consequently in much of the HVACR industry is also one of the more common applications. Shaded pole characteristics. They're used for small condenser and evaporator fans and some furnace fans. They usually have multi speeds. The direction of rotation is towards the shaded pole and this motor has a low starting torque, a low power factor and is very inefficient. <clears throat> AC motors. Now here you see a typical picture of a single phase uh, motor, AC motor. And as you can see, there is uh, your basic L1, L2, in which it's awfully difficult to see inside the motor how those things are actually wound around. But if you follow from L1 all the way around to the L2, you'll be able to see that it just is one continuous long stream. And as though as it goes in through L1 and it goes around the main poles over and over and over, you know, you look down inside of those motors and you can tell there's thousands and thousands of windings in there. As that's done, those windings going around that, uh, that main pole, they create that magnetic field once they're energized. And as you can see, they go around from one pole to the next pole to the next pole and out the L2, one continuous winding. Some of the guys will look at that and say, well, that's got to be wrong. Uh, that's, uh, that obviously has to be wrong because that would be a dead short. It's not a dead short. If you've ever seen uh, or maybe even restrung uh, a heat kit, an electric strip for an air handler. That's one solid continuous wire, but because there's windings in there, because those things are all looped up, uh, much like you're seeing here, there's work that's being done. And because there's work that's being done, there's energy being consumed. It's no longer a direct, uh, direct short. Uh, so what they're doing, they're creating that magnetic field, that magnetic field is again going to um, induce a magnetic field on that uh, that rotor in the center there. It's going to make this thing spin. It, that spin's going to um, going to oppose, or that that rotor is going to have a magnetic field that's going to oppose uh, the magnetic field of the stator. It's going to cause that thing to spin. So uh, take some time, look at this, uh, Google some other images and maybe even some YouTube videos at this point and see uh, how many different ways you can find that's going to make this make sense to you. Um, there's not a lot of rocket science and it's a very simplistic picture but there's a lot going on in the picture. So make sure and study this and understand how these works. That's not uh, going to be important just for this, uh, this one test but it, it also is going to be important just in life uh, out in the field to understand what's going on with these mo motors. Split phase motors and their characteristics. The repulsion start induction run RSIR motor is usually called split phase. 
The motor has both a run and a start winding. The motor requires both windings at startup, but only needs the run winding when operating at full speed. So obviously the start winding is going to drop out. It's used on fractional horsepower motors. And some applications may require the motor to be reversed. Consult motor manufacturer or data plate uh, requirements to determine how to reverse that motor. Usually it's a reversal of a couple of wires. They make it very simple nowadays. The split phase motor, RSIR characteristics. The motor must have its start winding disconnected from the power supply and this is done with either a centrifugal switch or a current relay. Now the centrifugal switch, if you're not familiar with how those work, just picture it uh, um, as having, <laughs> picture it as being on a, a merry-go-round. When somebody starts spinning that merry-go-round, what happens? It gets harder and harder for you to hang on. It starts pulling you towards the outside of that merry-go-round. Uh, and we've all seen as kids, uh, if, if you hit it just right, boy, that thing is going to make your legs uh, fly right up for just a second uh, in an outward motion. Same type of principle with a centrifugal switch. As that motor starts to spin, there is um, a small device on the end of the motor, which when the motor spins, it throws feet out. And those feet will make contact uh, or break contact, depending on the, the type of switch we're talking about. And at that point, at a certain RPM level that it makes that happen, it'll either engage something or uh, it'll disengage something. And a current sensing relay uh, is just, it's something that's, uh, it, it's a relay that clings on around, usually around uh, one of the hot legs of a specific device. And once that thing is energized or de-energized, uh, it's going to turn on or off the device. When it's energized, it, it's going, when the um, wire that it's around is energized, that wire has a magnetic field. We talked about this a little bit earlier. That magnetic field is going to make the contacts inside of that relay close or open, depending on how this thing's wired. And, uh, and, and it's going to work uh, in that particular style. Centrifugal switch located inside the motor. A current relay is located outside of the motor. The start winding is disconnected at approximately 70 to 80 percent of the motor's running speed. And that can be done either way, whether it's with uh, amps and, uh, uh, and a magnetic field or if it's done with a centrifugal switch. Either way. Centrifugal switch. Great, uh, uh, great little idea here. Uh, nice little picture to show you how these things work. And you can see once that thing starts to spin, that centrifugal switch is going to open up and it's going to break contact. The device is going to take it offline. The current sensing relay, uh, you can obviously see the brakes in the relay there, uh, kind of over by the S uh, area. And the current sensing relay just is going to be around a leg that's normally energized. Permanent split capacitor characteristics. A run capacitor is connected in series with the start winding. There are no starting devices. The start windings in the circuit during the motor operation, thus the name permanent. A common application for the PSC motor is direct drive multi-speed blower motors. The motor speed can be changed so the CFM or volume of air can be changed while the motor is under a load. Here's an example of a PSC motor. We've got our run capacitor always in the circuit. Multi-speed PSC motors, which are very common, they simply tap off different uh, sections of the winding. 
Uh, a lot of people, when it, when you look at a multi-speed uh, blower motor, don't just look at it as multi-speed. Think about what's happening on the process there. When you when you change a speed tap, in reality, you're adjusting its placement on that winding, which is adjusting its horsepower. So you are adjusting the speed up or down because you're adjusting the horsepower, and it's able to counteract the static pressure inside of that ductwork and blow harder or slow down. Capacitor start, induction run, motors, CSIR characteristics. A start capacitor is connected in series with the start winding. The start winding and the start capacitor must be disconnected from the power supply and this is done with a centrifugal switch, a current relay, or a potential relay. This motor may be found on applications requiring up to 5 horsepower. Capacitor start motors. Here's an example and we, we looked at the centrifugal switch. The centrifugal switch is in line there uh, by the capacitor and the capacitor uh, you can always tell what that is because it looks like an, like an equal sign uh, with one of the sides of the equal sign a little bit droopy. There's a current sensing relay in line with it um, which is very similar to the current sensing relay we took a look at a little bit ago and you can see again the capacitor uh, is in line with it and taken offline when the current sensing relay is not energized. Uh, when a potential relay is, is uh, used, the potential relay is looking for counter EMF uh, that's derived from the motor starting amps. Capacitor start, capacitor run characteristics. The motor has all the characteristics of the CSIR motor with the addition of the run capacitor wired in series with the start winding. This motor has a high starting torque, higher anyway than the CSIR, high power factor, high running torque, and is very efficient. This motor is commonly used um, with a potential relay to disconnect the start uh, capacitor. The motor is found on larger, up to 5 horsepower motors. Again, we've got our potential relay, and this is showing how uh, the actual capacitors are in line uh, with the system and then taken out of the system with the start uh, winding and all that kind of stuff. What about RPMs and the rotation? The RPM of a motor is determined by the number of poles in the stator non-moving part of the motor is the stator. A two-pole motor is 3600 RPMs. A four-pole motor is 1800 RPMs. And a six-pole motor is 1200 RPMs. The resistance of a motor's winding is taken using an ohm meter using the lowest scale. The run to start winding has the highest amount of resistance. The common to start winding has the next uh, lowest resistance and the common to run has the lowest resistance. And one thing to keep in mind, uh, just for practicality purposes when you're in the field, if you're checking the windings uh, on a motor, you don't have to necessarily remember uh, this sequence that the run to start has the highest resistance, the common to run has the lowest resistance. For the purpose of this test, obviously you've got to remember some of that. However, for the purpose of real life, if you remember that the measurement that you get between those three 
um, is supposed to be done in such a fashion that the two smaller measurements equal the bigger measurement then it's easier to remember at least it is for me so if you look here um, going from run to common we only had four ohms going from start to common we had 11 ohms and going from run to start we had 15 ohms notice the two smaller figures there 4 and 11 add up to 15 fairly practical way of doing it an open winding will be indicated by an infinite reading on the ohm meter a shorted winding will be indicated by reading of zero or less than the published value for the motor if you're using a uh, continuity tester of course uh, you know that'll that'll definitely register on the continuity tester as well for direct short but if there's any resistance at all that's going to uh, register as well to test for a short to ground or ground fault the ohm meter must be set to the highest scale any measurable reading is a ground fault condition do not energize the motor there's two types of bearings that are available for motors the sleeve bearing the sleeve bearing is a brass or bronze cylinder in which a shaft rotates the sleeve bearings have more friction and are used on lighter duty applications they also will be damaged if the motor is not turning at the correct rated RPM uh, such as windmilling type 2 is a ball bearing the supply voltage to a motor must be plus or minus 10 percent of the data nameplate rating now if you're an electrician you're probably twitching in your eyeballs right now uh, but that has been a, a standard for many many years uh, in the mechanical trade when it comes to start relays starting relays are used on a motor to disconnect the starting components of the motor those being either the start winding or a start capacitor this is accomplished by the use of four devices a centrifugal switch a current relay a potential relay or solid state relay again here's our centrifugal switch located inside the, the motor it's normally closed and it uses centrifugal force established by the rotor to open up the contact so the more this thing spins the more force that you get off of that rotor is going to open up those contacts the current relay current relay is located outside the motor housing the contacts are normally open the contacts are in series with the start winding it uses the current of the run winding to control the contacts now how does it use that current well, that's an interesting subject all on its own anytime that we've got current moving through a wire that current is going to create a magnetic field that magnetic field will then of course go into uh, that current sensing relay and it'll close the contacts in that relay they're also used with small fractional horsepower motors generally less, generally less than a uh, quarter horsepower and we've seen them uh, for years used with um, humidifiers and things of that nature current relay when it comes to current relays the M is connected to the run winding the S is connected to the start winding 
and the L is connected to the to the line. Uh, and there's other manufacturers out there. There are some other ones uh, like the five to one relay. Uh, now when it comes to the five to one relay uh, or the five to one hard start kits, um, you can always remember there's three terminals just like you've got here. Here you've got SML on there it's five, two and one. And the old saying for the five to one relays are five to one can she run? Five can common. She to start to run. Run. One. Potential relay. Potential relay is located out outside the motor housing. The contacts are normally closed. They're in series with the start winding and the start capacitor. They're used with the CS and CSR motors. And remember the CS and CSR capacitor start and then the CSR is capacitor start and capacitor run. They're used with fractional horsepower motors, third horsepower through five horsepower. And when they're talking about integral horsepower motors, which is kind of a big word, integral comes from the integer uh, and from the root word integer, which is uh, you know meaning whole or one uh, whole. So if you look at an intra, uh, integral uh, horsepower motors, that means it's going to be uh, a true number: one horse, two horse, three horse, five horse, seven horse. Uh, just don't, it's going to be a, a number uh, without fractions. Potential relay. Back or counter electromotive force of the start windings used to energize the coil of the relay to open the contacts. The coils identified by terminals marked 5 and 2. The coil resistance is generally somewhere between 3,000 ohms and 16,000 ohms. The contacts are identified by terminals marked 2 and 1. Here's your potential relay that I was talking about just a second ago. Okay, 5 to 1. Can she run? Five can common. Two she start run. One. Terminal five is the common. Terminal two is the start. Terminal one is the start cap or the run. The capacitor start run hooked up. Capacitors in general. When it comes to capacitors, they're designed to assist a motor either in starting or in running. The start capacitor gives the motor a little bit higher starting torque. The run cap gives the motor a higher operating efficiency. They're measured, uh, or, or the capacitance is measured in microfarads. And for, some of the meters might actually say MFD or microfarad on it, uh, but it's worth noting that the symbol for that looks like a, a funny shaped U with an F next to it, a lowercase F. Uh, and the funny ta uh, shaped U just has like a dog tail on the left end of the U. Voltage rating. Always use the voltage rating of the one designed for the motor. If the voltage exceeds this rating, the capacitor could be damaged. MFD equals microfarad. 
capacitors can be wired in series or parallel to change the capacitance rating of the circuit. When connected in parallel, the total capacitance is additive. So the capacitance of capacitor 1 plus capacitor 2 is going to equal uh, the total capacitance. When connected in series, this is the calculation and it really gets much more difficult. Total capacitance equals C1 times C2 divided by C1 plus C2. When testing, a capacitor is voltage uh, is a voltage storage device. It can store up to the peak voltage of an AC circuit. The capacitor needs to be slowly discharged before it's handled. This should never be done with a screwdriver. The sudden discharge may damage the capacitor, could make it pop. Or you could use, um, if you're not using a special meter that's going to bleed that off, you could use a 20,000 ohm 2 watt resistor to slowly discharge that capacitor. The capacitor can also be discharged using an analog or digital voltmeter, which I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit there. Start at the highest voltage scale and work down to the lowest scale. When voltage no longer is displayed on the meter, the capacitor is discharged. A 20,000 ohm 2 watt resistor is also permanently connected to the start capacitor to discharge the capacitor during the off cycle of the motor to avoid damaging the relay on startup. And this is fairly common. It's not on all of them, so I don't mean to indicate that it's on all of them, but it is on quite a few of them these days. Once the capacitor voltage has been discharged, further testing may be completed using an ohm meter. Use the R times 1K or R times 10K scale on an analog meter. Now what are we looking at there? Resistance times 1000 or resistance times 10,000 scale. The scale to use on a digital is sometimes difficult to determine, so a technician would need to learn how the meter is being used um, and, and how to diagnose those capacitors with that particular meter. Testing for an open capacitor, the analog meter would stay at no scale deflection, which is the infinite reading. The digital meter may display a 1 on the left of the digital readout or an OL or some other types of method to let you know that it's an infinite reading. Testing for a shorted capacitor. The analog meter would go full scale de deflection to zero and the digital would go to zero. Testing for a good capacitor. The analog meter would go towards full scale deflection, which is zero reading, and then slowly return to the no scale position, which would be infinite. So the meter needle would have to, or would wave at you. A digital may be used, but it's much more difficult to figure out. Right? Or you could simply check for capacitance. If you change it to your microfarad reading and check from one terminal to the next, you should be within your uh, microfarad reading uh, that the manufacturer says you should be within. Uh, for instance, many of the capacitors nowadays give you a plus or minus tolerance stamped right on the capacitor. I say plus or minus 5%. So if you've got a 10 microfarad capacitor, and you're checking it uh, on the capacitance or microfarad setting from one terminal to the next, it should read really close to 10 microfarads. If it's not, does it get plus or minus 5%? K 
Continuing on the electrical path, we'll talk briefly about AC motors, uh, particularly uh, three-phase motors now. Three-phase motors use three windings that are 120 degrees out of phase. A large starting torque is produced and the motor has a very high running efficiency. Three-phase motors do not use any start windings, capacitors, or starting relays. Three-phase motors can be reversed by reversing any two power leads. Adding to that, we'll talk about actuator motors. These are specialized motors used with valves and dampers, normally with a swing arm or something like that on there. They are a shaded pole motor with a very low RPM. There are two applications these motors are used with, dual position and proportional. Dual position motors operate valves either open or closed. <clears throat> Oftentimes if they're partially opened or closed, there will be a setting that prohibits the valve uh, permanently from opening or closing unless the, unless the setting is changed again by a technician. The proportional motor is used with a valve or damper that is required to be open, closed, or any number of positions in between. A specialized circuit is required that uses two potentiometers. One of the potentiometers is a feedback potentiometer that, op uh, that allows the motor to stop at any position from fully open to fully closed. Moving on to transformers. Transformers transfer electric energy from one circuit to another by induction. They have a primary and a secondary winding. The primary winding is connected to the line side of the circuit while the secondary winding is connected to the load side of the circuit. And they have a magnetic connection between the windings, which is called mutual induction or inductance. Now keep in mind, even when you're looking at one of these off of the shelf and it's got this nice plastic casing over it, uh, it you see a bunch of wires on there and it's important to note that the primary or the high voltage is not touching your secondary or the lower voltage. Uh, those motors are operate or those wires uh, are powered on the secondary side by inductance. Remember throughout the entire electrical portion of what we've been talking about, we've been talking about magnetism and magnetism, particularly in transformers uh, and windings of any sort, can cause uh, electricity and electricity, of course, causes magnetism. Voltage induced in the secondary may be stepped up or down. A step down has fewer turns of wire on the secondary. A step up has more turns of wire on the secondary. And of course, there's a few more uh, intricacies that go into that. But one thing to keep in mind with transformers, if a question comes up in which you've got to figure out what your secondary voltage is based on what your primary voltage is, 
If it's your traditional run-of-the-mill step-down transformer, for instance, 120 volts in and 24 volts out the other side, which is very common in the HVAC industry. <clears throat> You'll take that 120 volts in and the number of loops that you're given on the primary side and you're going to divide the 120 volts by the amount of loops that you've got on the primary side. That will tell you how much voltage you've got on each individual loop. From there you have to count the amount of turns or loops on the secondary side. The loops on the secondary side are directly proportional to the loops on the primary side. So for instance, just to make it easy, nice round numbers. If we have 120 volts and we've got 10 wraps on the primary side, then each wrap is going to be 12 volts. So if we wanted to have 24 volts coming out the other side, knowing that each wrap is going to be 12 volts, it would take two wraps on the secondary side to make 24 volts. Now in real life, you've got thousands and thousands of wraps that you're dealing with. But normally, for the purpose of taking tests and figuring out uh, questions and, and mathematics skills and things like that, just to get the general concepts down, they will uh, diminish those amounts of wraps into uh, a fairly uh, trivial simple picture like you see here in front of you. Uh, the whole idea is not to confuse you, the idea is to see if you grasp the concept of how you would figure this stuff out. Moving on to your meters. Different types. There are two basic types of ohm meters. There's an analog, which you don't see nearly as much anymore has a needle which deflects across a, a scale. It operates on the principle of electromagnetism. Remember, anytime there's power involved, there's a magnetic field involved as well. A second type of ohm meter is a digital ohm meter. It has a solid state circuitry to produce a digital or numeric readout. When it comes to digital meters, they're more rugged and more accurate than the analog. After all, you can get down to the tenth uh, of, a, of an ohm, uh, of a degree, uh, your voltage readings are very accurate, your amps, you can get down into micro, uh, which is the millionth of an amp. Uh, so, I mean, they're very, very accurate. They're very temperature sensitive. If you've ever taken a meter from a cold winter day, into a nice warm house to do service work, you'll notice the LED is all over the place. If you've ever used, uh, for instance, a Dwyer Digital, uh, you'll notice that when you go from outside to inside on a cold or hot day, uh, your static uh, pressure readout is going to change based on uh, that meter getting up to current room conditions. So you want to make sure and take all your digital meters in in the evening when you're finished with your work and so that they can stay at normal room temperature instead of getting cold and hot. You know, another thing to, uh, you know, just for practicality's sake, you know, common sense would tell you that if you're taking those from outside to inside, your LED is sweating. So if you have sweat on the outside where you can wipe it off because it's fogging over when you go in the house, like my glasses do, then most likely you're going to get moisture on the inside of that meter and it's just not going to handle that kind of um, ruggedness so take care of your meters they don't give them away the LED readout may not be accurate in very cold conditions or the LED readout will go black in very hot conditions check the operating range of your digital meter before using it to evaluate the condition of equipment being tested some of this stuff doesn't go up above 600 volts uh, or is not intended to be used above 600 volts or a certain amp range. 
Uh, some are not meant to discharge a capacitor while they can check capacitance. So make sure you know those things. It is certainly uh, the one thing that you don't want to be involved in is any situation where you're using trusted test instruments uh, that are there to help you diagnose potentially dangerous situations and you cause the dangerous situation because of the way that you're using it. Specific meters that perform only one function, a mega ohm meter, used to test only for shorts to grounds or ground faults on motors. Milliamp or microamp meter, used to measure only very low flow, uh, current flows. Now, obviously, some of this stuff you're going to be able to find <clears throat> on a current uh, multimeter, like the milliamp, microamp, but you can also get standalone meters as well. Millivolt meter, used to measure only very low volts. VOM, volt ohm meter, designed to perform the multiple tasks of volts, ohms, and milliamps. Now, your, your multimeters are going to contain, like I said, most of this stuff. Uh, and the one thing that, that has always been traditionally uh, thought of was that it is much more accurate to get a standalone meter than to use a multimeter for everything. Also, uh, as a side note, much more expensive. Okay, keep in mind, even though their uh, multimeter is performing a ton of different tasks, each of those tasks uh, have to conform to the UL listing uh, and the parameters that the standalone meter would have to conform to. So uh, if it makes you feel better about using that type of meter standalone uh, or multimeter, great, use it. Uh, but don't use it because of the accuracy type. The, the, the accuracy on these should be fairly comparable no matter which one you use. Ammeters. The ammeters used in the HVACR industry uh, so that you can indicate the RMS value of, of the voltage. True RMS ammeters are available when required on buildings that are electronically oriented, like data centers, uh, places that have lots of variable, uh, variable frequency drives, lots of high intensity lighting, things like that. <clears throat> An ammeter may be inserted either in line or as a clamp on. An inline connection is used on milliamp or one thousandth of an amp or microamp one millionth of an amp circuits. And you know, when you think about it, what type of circuits are we talking about there? Well, you know, one of the most practical ones would be a flame sensor. Uh, when you're checking a flame sensor, you're looking for microamps. Now, roughly speaking, somewhere between two and seven is normal, but it's not out of the normal range to go between one and a half and up to ten. Uh, and that's going to be all done in circuit, so or in series. So you would have to hook one of, uh, end of your uh, meter to the actual flame sensor, and the other end would have to go to the lead, and the testing is going to be done right straight through that meter, so if, it, if one of the leads slips off, your flame will go out. A clamp on amp meter may be used when testing the amp draw on 24 volt circuits. The clamp on amp meter will not be accurate enough to read the low amperage, so a 10 loop coil is placed in the series when the circuit is being tested. This will amplify the current by 10 and the, and the meter will be able to indicate this amplified amperage. Technologies come a long ways. It's advanced to where one meter can do it all. And when you look at a multimeter, some of the things you got to look at is getting something that's auto ranged uh, versus fixed range. You know, which one is going to be, you know, right for you. Something that does volts, amps, ohms, capacitors, and a lot more. And some of the little micro details you want to pay attention to is does it do DC and AC? Does it do 
milliamps, microamps, and then high ranges of amps. What volt range are we talking about? Does it um, make a difference on your particular multimeter whether or not you're discharging a capacitor? This concludes part, uh, part one and there's part two that you'll be able to study from as well all contained in this particular uh, mock-up of our uh, core prep presentation. Here we go into part two of the core service review. Uh, part two we're going to start right out with electrical diagrams uh, which are always a fun material and when we're looking at diagrams it's important to understand what you actually see on those diagrams as far as the symbols. If you don't know what the symbols mean it's awfully hard to uh, be on par with anything else. So we'll look at some of those symbols. Symbols are graphic representations of devices. They're for both loads and load controllers. The symbol for a load is usually a circle. The symbol for a load controller is different for each load controller. Looking at this particular symbol, which is very common, this means that we've got a single pull, single throw area. Okay, basically we're breaking one area on a relay or a contactor or a spot uh, on the system. This is the symbol for a single pull, single throw, normally open area okay, or contact. So if you look at this and you look at those uh, big square relays, oftentimes by those relays, if you can still make them out and they're brand new and you can read the actual markings on them, you'll see um, symbols that have an open area, meaning a space uh, between the two contact points like this, which means normally open. That means there's no contact across there. There's no, no electrical current uh, that's supposed to flow acro across there at all. Or you'll see a symbol that looks very similar to this, uh, which is a single pole, single throw, normally closed contact. So in looking at this, with that slash through the center there, that means normally with no power applied, that makes contact across that, that set of contacts. So uh, it's normally closed. So with no power applied to the, to the actual coil, you're gonna have continuity across that section of the contacts or across that section on the, on the diagram. Now, we add another one into the mix. Here we've got a double pole, single throw set of contacts. What do you think this one is? A single pole, double throw set of contacts. <clears throat> Now notice there, a little bit different uh, sequence. We've got one set of contacts is normally closed and one set of contacts are normally open. Next symbol, double pull, double throw set of contacts. This is the symbol for a thermostat, more typically a heating thermostat. <clears throat> Notice that as the temperature drops, that's how I always remember it, whichever way the lever is uh, going to make contact, as that temperature drops, the lever will drop with it, 
And down, you know, typically that's not exactly the way that works, but that's how it's easier to remember when you're looking at these contracts. Uh, as the temperature drops, you'll make contact and it'll turn on the heat. Once it heats up, lift up that contact, we break the contact and the heat turns off. This is just the opposite. It's a cooling thermostat. When the temperature rises, it makes contact, bringing on the cooling cycle, which cools it down. And as it cools, the temperature falls and it breaks contact, turns off the air condition. Now we run into uh, a pressure switch. Okay, and more typically, a high pressure switch. When the pressure rises, it breaks contact, uh, and whatever the device is, turns off, or depending on the scenario, uh, turns on. Here, as you might guess, this is a low pressure switch. It closes on temperature rise. So once the temperature falls, what happens? Once the temperature falls, it breaks contact till that pressure rolls back up again. Once that pressure rolls back up, it makes contact and we're ready to rock and roll. Now here is a goofy one. And notice we got a set of contacts there. We've already been over those. A normally closed set of contacts. So what is that portion above it? Well, that's the symbol for a thermal overload. As you might guess, these symbols are all important. Uh, naming these on a test could be the difference between making and breaking that grade. This is the symbol for a motor. And then, of course, you're going to have uh, a legend for every wiring diagram. You know, hopefully you can uh, you can actually read the ledger or the legend, and it should look very similar to this. We got fan motor. CF uh, is going to be your condenser fan. IBM indoor blower motor. Uh, comp compressor. FR fan. There are three basic diagrams that you may be required uh, to look at and to follow. And those three basic diagrams are field wiring diagrams, showing what needs to be wired after installed, not done from the factory, or pictorial diagrams. Pictorial diagrams are typically known uh, to, sh uh, to show you exactly where the items go uh, in the service area and the schematic or ladder diagram which shows you uh, electrically speaking where they go and which may not be the same as where they're actually located inside of your service panel. A field wiring diagram. Field wiring diagrams are typically used by the installer <clears throat> as the equipment is being installed It shows the wiring brought to the HVACR equipment. And one thing you've got to keep in mind is you've got to know your code. Uh, a wiring code, mostly for low voltage, is identified. Uh, now, when I'm saying know your code, you, you need to know state and local regulations and laws, but wiring code uh, in general is going to be fairly typical from manufacturer to manufacturer as to how they want your low voltage hooked up. For instance, uh, low voltage, uh, meaning 24 volts on a red, uh, typically is going to be your hot wire uh, or your power wire for your transformer. And white would be your common wire on most things. And maybe for your two wire, you use it for that. But if you're wiring up a thermostat, white typically is going to be your heating wire. So knowing those little nuances is important. A thick broken line indicates line voltage. So that's your high voltage. 
A thin broken line indicates low voltage, which may or may not be field wiring. Next, a pictorial diagram. Pictorial diagrams are a snapshot or a picture of the actual factory installed wiring, okay, as well as usually where this stuff is located inside the service area. So it actually not, not only shows you uh, oftentimes some of the wiring, but it also shows you where this stuff is placed inside of the actual service panel. Schematic diagrams, okay, or better known as ladder diagrams. They're groups of lines and electrical symbols, which is where what we just went over uh, comes in handy, uh, are usually going to be arranged in a ladder formation. It's going to show your operational sequence uh, of the equipment. And you've got to have some sort of a legend to know what those symbols are. You know, if you go online and you Google uh, electrical symbols, you're going to find thousands and thousands of symbols. And sometimes you're going to find one symbol has more than one meaning. So knowing what your manufacturer is, is actually talking about is obviously going to be very important. A thick solid line indicates line voltage wiring. <clears throat> typically going to be the outside of the ladder or the legs of the ladder uh, and then also you may have your connectors in between the rungs of the ladder could also be um, your high voltage or line voltage as well but typically your, your neutral and line voltage are going to be your outside legs or your two line voltage would be your outside legs. A thin solid line indicates low voltage wiring Sometimes those get hard to uh, tell the difference between, especially when you start to get some weatherization. The ladder diagram design. The ladder diagram has vertical and horizontal lines. And we've talked about this a little bit already, but it's important to, uh, to re revisit this. The vertical lines represent the line or the low voltage power source. The horizontal lines represent the individual circuits. Each horizontal line is numbered on the left side of the diagram. And although since we're starting to get a lot more um, appliances from a lot more areas around the world that that does change from time to time. I know in the real world everything can't fit in this nice little box we're talking about here but for the purpose of this test we need to keep things in perspective uh, and for the purpose of the test each horizontal line is numbered on the left side of the diagram. A horizontal line that has a load on it will be controlling a set of contacts that will be noted on the right hand side. <clears throat> These are some diagrams and schematics. And if you look here, um, there's there's a lot going on. Now we'll break into some of the soft skills. When it comes to soft skills, typically what we're talking about is dealing with customers, dealing with customers and you could also say uh, dealing with coworkers as well. <clears throat> so soft skills will primarily focus on communication with customers. Soft skills also deals with mathematics. Communication with customers is huge. Tene uh, technicians and installers communicate with the customer in the following ways. Writing, um, you, you're making out <clears throat> your receipts, your service tickets, your records, however you want to put it, you're putting that stuff down on paper. It has to be detailed, 
uh, it has to be um, ha having enough explanation on there that the customer is going to be able to know why you're charging them, what they're what you're charging them, uh, and be able to recount that later if the if they're not the only one that's paying the bill. Uh, you deal with them orally. You're you're talking to them. Be careful with your language. Be nice. Allow them to say what they need to say so that you both can continue on with the uh, with the service call. And then of course your nonverbal uh, language is huge. Uh, if any of you are, are parents and you deal with uh, your teenage kids, nonverbal language is as loud as a Mack truck. Uh, you definitely know when your child is done talking to you or done listening to you. Take that to work with you. You also uh, will give off that same aura to a customer or you can pick up on that from a customer. So nonverbal communication is huge. Mathematics. If you don't feel comfortable with the following information on math, then you might want to take a brush up course in math before you take the core exam. Hey, there are some mathematics on the exam. Not a ton, but there are some. <clears throat> Whole numbers, you need to be able to add, subtract, multiply, uh, multiply and divide whole numbers. Fractions, you got to be able to add, subtract, multiply and divide fractions. Percentages, what percent of 26 is 100? Well, if 100 is the whole or 100 percent, 26 of 100 would be 26 percent. Ratios. What's the ratio of 10 to 1 versus 1 to 10? Proportion. What's the proportion of the window area in your home compared to the entire wall area? <clears throat> how would you figure something like that out? Well, how do you figure out area in general? And I always remember it from grade school, length times width as opposed to volume to figure out the volume of a space or or um, a box or or something your volume would be a little bit different instead of just length times width which is area volume is length times width times height and i don't want to scare you when we get into mathematics sometimes mathematics can be scary so if you're having an issue with this stuff make sure that you spend Use an algebra for problem solving. <clears throat> like C equals pi times D. What is pi? That little weird symbol that's up there. Pi is 3.14. D is 2 times the radius. Well, what's the radius? Any idea what the radius is? Well, the radius is half the diameter. So if you take the radius times 2, that equals the diameter. CFM equals A, or area, times V, velocity. The latent heat of BTUs per hour equals the total airflow in feet cubed per minute times 0.68 times your delta grains. And what is that grains? Could that be moisture content of the air? Area equals pi r squared. r again is radius. Squared would be taking the number times itself. So if it's the radius squared and the radius is 2, then it would be 2 times 2 or 4. Using geometry. 
geometry, you could be using units of measurement like inches, feet, millimeters, and then transferring one to the other. A right triangle. Figuring out the right triangle. 30, 60, 90 degree, 45, 45, 90, you know, figuring out the actual angles uh, and the types of triangles we're talking about, obviously important. Parallels and perpendiculars, estimating areas, parameters, and volumes. <clears throat> Using computers. Ooh, some people get really freaked out by the use of computers. Well, taking a prep course actually online uh, is a testament to whether or not you're okay with computers. Now, maybe somebody registered you for this prep course and you're being forced to do it online, uh, and that's kind of cheating. But for the most part, using computers is, is where we are in society. So you have to have a basic knowledge of how to do this stuff got to be able to use a mouse and keyboard you know nowadays you have a lot of voice automation using dragon and things like that the dray, uh, display could be a cathode ray tube or an LCD panel hey, understanding the difference between those the cathode ray tube is going to look like an old TV a tube TV or you've got the flat panels Using the different operating systems, okay, whether it's uh, you know the primitive style or the new Windows 8 uh, or Windows 7, Vista, XP, understanding the difference between those two, um, very important. Using software programs, okay, we use them in order to communicate, uh, and we use them in order to make up service records, plan diagrams engineer floor plans using computers as, as a form of record keeping whether you're uh, primitive in the process uh, doing it on a regular old spreadsheet or you're a little more advanced using QuickBooks or something like that and then of course use of computers in the field you're starting to see that more and more every day with transducers in effect uh, with programming capabilities on the job site, um, using computers in the field is going to be something that's imperative. Understanding those concepts and principles uh, is going to be very important going forward. And for the purpose of this test, understanding the basics of all of these things with computers um, obviously is, is something that's going to be important to a service technician or an installer, so it's got to be important for the test as well. Ah, moving on, <clears throat> personal ethics and conduct. How do you conduct yourself? Personal characteristics first. Honesty means a refusal to lie, steal, or deceive in any way. Now, that doesn't only mean when people are looking. That means regardless of whether or not people are looking. I once heard a guy say, I tell all of my employees when they're in a house, to treat it as though they're always on a nanny cam and people watch everything they do. And, you know, that might be a little bit doom and gloom or dark or, uh, you know, cynical, but that's a great philosophy. If you always treat things uh, that you're doing inside of a house like somebody's watching you, you're always going to be doing your best job. We should be doing that anytime, anyway, uh, but you know that's just one added aspect to it dependability means to be reliable believable and trustworthy positive work ethic means give a day's work for a day's pay Okay, your positive work ethic, you don't have to love everything you do. In fact, there's a lot of things uh, in the working world that a lot of us don't necessarily enjoy. But we do them because there are certain things that do keep us around, things we love. And customers need to see that too. But having a good, positive attitude 
while you're working about your company, uh, about what you're doing, about the customer themselves, maybe about the appliance, whatever it takes uh, to, to drive you, make sure that that customer is seeing that and so are your coworkers. Patience. Stick it out and continue without complaining. How many times you've been on a service call at four o'clock and the office has already dished out the last two calls that you have of the day, but that four o'clock call takes two hours longer than you thought it would, but you still got two calls left. Now you're going to miss supper. You might miss uh, one of the TV shows that you like or something like that. Uh, you know, if the customer feels like they're burdening you, it's going to change that dynamic, the relationship. So make sure that you're sticking it out. You're there to work, you're there to make money, you're there because you're in the people business. And be tolerant. Endure things, put up with whatever you've got to put up with to get through your service call. Some of the service calls are going to put you in not the nicest predicaments. Some of them are going to put you in spectacular scenarios. But you can't pick and choose which ones you're going to do and which ones you're not. Uh, that's not the type of business that we've chosen. You have to do all aspects of the business. You have to please lots of different kinds of people. So be tolerant of all kinds of individuals. And behave yourself. Integrity. Adhere to a code of moral values. You know, when it comes to integrity, that goes back to the nanny cam comment I made a little bit ago. If you always treat every service call like somebody's watching, you're always going to be doing your best job. Always maintain your integrity even when nobody's looking. Loyalty. Don't go out to a job site and complain about your coworkers or complain about your, your employer or your boss or your home or anything like that. Loyalty is easy when everything's going good. Where our true colors show through is during the off times, when people are getting laid off, uh, when, when work is skimpy, or on the opposite end, when there's no breaks, when we're working to the bone. Loyalty is always something that we have to work on. Um, but if you have loyalty, uh, it's awfully, awfully um, huge as far as a testament to your character. You also want to make sure that you're dressing appropriately. You're being a team member. And your time management uh, is spectacular. The, the systems that you work on nowadays are getting more and more and more complicated, but you're not being given more time to work on those. And realize the consequence of substance abuse. If you're drinking booze the night before or doing something worse, tomorrow's going to come. It isn't going to go anywhere. And eventually, that's going to catch up with you on the job or it's going to prohibit you from going to the job, which will end in you having no job. Unfortunately, one of the side effects of an employee that has substance abuse issues is nobody catches it right away. And they uh, continue to work for a little bit of time, at least, uh, while giving the company a little bit of a bad rap. Um, that often happens. So make sure you realize the consequences of substance abuse, not just for yourself. You know, we're, we're not in any of this for ourselves. We have a family back home. We have coworkers that we're working with. And we have customers out there. Interpersonal relations. Responding to the customer's needs. The first thing you try to do when you arrive on the job check in with the customer. Make sure they know you're there and you're now their, uh, <laughs> they're now your top priority. Why is that? Because A, it's good customer relations. Next, makes them feel important. Okay, you're there, uh, they're feeling comfortable now, you're gonna take care of the problem. And 
they might give you information that will help you solve the problem. Uh, so starting the service call off by making them feel warm and fuzzy uh, by giving them your full undivided attention is important. Another thing uh, that, that comes into play here is one, their internal clock in their head starts ticking. If you sit out in the van for 10 minutes and start writing up service reports and call the shop and all that kind of stuff, in their mind, you're not on their job yet. So if you go up there and meet them first and start your service call right away, their internal clock starts ticking. Now, instead of saying, well, I only saw him for 10 minutes and he charged me X amount of money. Well, now you saw him right away. You've extended the amount of face time you have with the customer. And in the end, uh, that's going to work out good for your customer and for you and your callbacks. You need to understand that the customer's the speaker. They're the ones that's most important, at least to them, and they're paying you to be there. We're in the people business. Understand that you're the listener. You have to let them get it all out. Even if your coworker or yourself was out there earlier that day to fix that problem and it's back again, they're going to be upset about it most likely, but totally dismissing them or acting upset yourself is not going to solve that problem. The only thing that's going to solve that, that problem is to let them tell you or express to you what their issue is. And once they're done, they're done. Now fix it. Understand what they want. You know, is it a no heat call? Is it no cooling? Is it making a noise, an odor? Understand what that is. And then, of course, gather the information, uh, all the information that you can on this particular customer so that you know some of the history and where you're going. And make sure that the customer information is correct. When you're going over your service ticket, make sure that you're, you're writing down and gathering the correct information from them so that the office has, uh, you know, valid information. Installers and techs are always making agreements with customers. What constitutes an agreement? It could be verbal. You say this, they say this. It could be written and it could be witnessed. Any of these things can constitute uh, an agreement. And the whole idea behind, you know, talking about the agreement portion is to let you know that when you're obligating yourself to do something, you have to follow through. So don't just make up stuff uh, for the customer to get yourself through the job site because they're not going to go away. They're going to remember that. Safety. Understanding how to properly handle hazardous materials is important. Your personal safety, important. Electrical safety, deadly important. Understanding how to properly braze and solder. How to handle refrigerants properly. So first we'll look at hazardous materials. MSDS sheets, up, utmost important. Material safety data sheets. And while they change a little bit uh, from time to time, the information that's required on them doesn't change that much. They got to be on the shop vehicle. Now, they don't have to be there in a library form like they used to be. Uh, they can be in digital form. They can be on a thumb drive. They can be, uh, you can have a subscription to MSDS.com. Uh, that you can get onto and and recount all of that stuff uh, for an OSHA official or for yourself if need be. They've got to be on the construction site and they have to be in the office. If you're in an application that could contain hazardous gases, you have to have ventilation never install anything with open type motors or relays. Of course, you're going to have arcs and sparks uh, that could create an explosion or a combustible situation. Safety with refrigerant cylinders going to include making sure that they stay below a certain temperature. 
Extremely high hydrostatic pressures develop when this stuff gets at elevated temperatures and of course refrigerant expands. So the hotter it gets, the more it expands, the more pressure it puts on the cylinder and the more likely you are to have an accident. DOT, Federal Regulatory Agency, has jurisdiction over handling, shipping, and labeling of the refrigerant uh, cylinders. When you're talking about anything on wheels, it's the Department of Transportation that takes precedence. Now, some of the state tests, uh, some of the licensing tests, they trick you. They'll say, uh, you know, they'll reword this a little bit and they'll say, okay, your, your choices are the DOT, the EPA, OSHA, uh, or something else. And if it's on wheels, it's always going to be DOT. DOT regulations also include all other pressurized containers. They also include your service vehicle. Hazards associated with HVACR work uh, include solvents, fuels, construction materials, flammable gases, and of course toxic gases. Which leads us into gases and hazards. Ammonia and sulfur dioxide gases are really powerful and you've got to get out of the area if something goes sideways with those. What about a gas that you can't smell like CO? Okay, if you've got a gas like CO that could potentially be uh, present, you have to have uh, a self-contained breathing apparatus on uh, and you should have some ventilation present uh, as well to clear out that area. Uh, oftentimes if you're going to be in an area that could potentially have CO, uh, people are going to have a personal uh, CO monitor that will be like in their pocket pad or something like that. What about phosgene gas or hydrochloric or hydrofluoric acid? What about those? How do you get those? Well, phosgene gas and hydrochloric, hydrofluoric acid uh, are all side effects from having flames in front of refrigerants okay, or the refrigerant oil. We've all seen that green gas that comes out the end of the refrigerant pipe if we're reusing the line set, but we're brazing in a coil uh, or a condenser. Hey, that's phosgene gas. This stuff acts very similar to uh, chlorine when it gets in your body. Uh, you inhale that. It's a very heavy uh, gas and it uh, it does some damage to your lungs. So you want to make sure that you're taking care of, of yourself while you're out on the job site. Even simple jobs that you do day after day after day. Sometimes those are the ones that are difficult to, to remember all the safety stuff on because it's so monotonous. Confined space or enclosed uh, space hazards. A confined space is a potential hazard. Confined or enclosed spaces present the following hazards. Okay, they could be flammable. Okay, there's no dilution air down in those areas. Could be toxic. If there's no air coming in and out, you could have stale air with fumes and gases down in that area. Uh, you could have irritants or corrosive material down there and it could be short on oxygen. If you're down there and you're breathing that air and there's no more air coming back down in there, you could uh, become asphyxiated, short on air, well, which gives you a euphoric feeling and eventually you pass out. Personal safety. Personal safety is pretty simple. You could sum it up by saying, I'll take care of me, you take care of you, and occasionally, how about we look up and look around and see what each other are doing to make sure that uh, something that we can't see isn't going to hit us. What are some ways in which you could provide for your own safety on the job? There's a long list of these, I'm warning you, but any number of these can be on the test. And although you might not follow all these safety precautions, 
You can't argue with the principle behind them. So remember what they are. Protective eyewear, gloves, hard hats, hearing protection, driving safely, eye protection, reporting accidents, service vehicle, securing any cargo, boots, housekeeping, proper storage of material and equipment, regular cleanup. And when we're talking about proper storage, uh, you wouldn't want to have things stored next to each other that aren't like uh, fire hazards. For instance, would you want to have a, a chemical that reacts with water in the instance of a fire? It would cause a reaction with the water uh, right next to something that you would typically put out with fire or with water if it was on fire. And that would be counterintuitive. And proper lad up, a ladder set up and securing. Electrical safety. Hey, take a good look at this uh, this diagram here. Okay, you can pause it, you can come back to it, uh, but when we're talking about electrical safety, it doesn't it doesn't take a whole lot for somebody to to be electrocuted, to not go home, or to be different when they do go home. And look at this: two milliamps to 10 milliamps, muscles can, can uh, contract. You've got a sensation there. You know at 2 milliamps, 2 one thousandths of an amp, that there's something there. Look at that 50 to, uh, 50 to 100 milliamps. 50 to 100 milliamps, you're going into fibrillation, most likely. 50 to 100 thousandths of an amp. That is such a small amount, and we, generally speaking, don't associate death with such low amounts of power. Burns. Burns are generally caused by direct contact with an electrical arc. They're an unfortunate side effect. Severe burns can be received from an electric arc. An arc can be caused by a defective switch or even a broken wire, and your body can become part of that electrical current. An arc blast, an arc blast, the pressure wave resulting from an intense, sudden heating of material with the resultant air immediately surrounding it being extremely powerful. If you go to YouTube and you look up arc flash, um, you're going to have some pretty gnarly videos that come up. Um, arc flashes, generally speaking, uh, come from a dead bolted short. Okay, not from your screwdriver or something like that. Something in the in the system goes sideways. We have a dead bolted short. At that point, copper expands some five thousand times, almost immediately, it becomes molten. Related incidents. Instinctively pulling away from a shock may cause one to fall off a ladder on the moving machinery or into an open electrical panel. You think about that. How many of you have been shocked by 24 volts on a thermostat? I know I have. And when I got shocked, I jumped like it was a million volts. And just for a second, I forgot what I was doing. Now think about being on a ladder. Just for that second, you're going to forget you're on a ladder. But that ground is going to be there to remind you. Uh, fall related injuries or secondary related injuries, usually dealing with a fall, are far more common for, uh, that, are, that are preempted by an electric shock uh, than injuries from the shock itself at, at the voltages we typically work at anyway. Some of the precautions you can, say, you can take, uh, use caution, good sense around live equipment. And when it comes to live equipment, you have to know NFPA 70E. NFPA 70E is the life safety manual that's mandatory for electricians to understand and know. And in there, the NFPA 70E, starting in 2012, um, 
has come out with some some different uh, viewpoints on when you have to have arc flash protection and for the most part if it's live whether you're testing or repairing you're gonna have to have some form of arc flash protection on whether it's the big old suit or some uh, minimized amount of protection you're gonna have to have something so understand that principle it's not there to be a pain in your neck it's there to save your life use GFCI's whenever you can to protect against electrical shock ground fault circuit interrupters follow the proper lockout tagout procedures we've all been down the road where we've sent the customer down to shut off the breaker they shut off the wrong ones and boom we may not have gotten shocked but something might have got shorted out use extension cords of proper size and not worn or frayed fires class A fire is a fire that involves uh, burning of wood paper could be clothing uh, it's considered ordinary combustibles generally speaking stuff that you could put out with water is considered a type A fire a class B fire class B fire uh, is what I consider flowable fires okay these are a little bit different than type 1 because oftentimes if you're trying to put out a class B type fire with water it's going to make that fire spread just think of a grease fire in your kitchen. A fire that contains oil, grease, paint, varnish, or other chemicals uh, like diesel fuel or oil uh, out on a job site. Typically, a smothering agent like potentially foam is required for extinguishing this type of fire. Also, a more uh, uh, um, notable common fire extinguisher for this type of fire is CO2 which instead of taking away the heat uh, like water would on a type A fire it takes away the oxygen and stifles the flame however if you're using a CO2 fire extinguisher make sure that you have a ventilation uh, apparatus nearby or self-contained breathing apparatus that you're wearing because it's going to displace the oxygen in the area class C fires things get serious real quick class C fires are an electrical fire you have to use some kind of a non-conducting agent like CO2 uh, to put out the fire. Um, you would not want to use the aqueous foam on a type C fire because the aqueous foam um, that they talked about for type B is water-based. Uh, so generally speaking you're gonna be some kind of uh, CO2 or something like that uh, to put this stuff out. It's always assumed that a class C fire an electrical fire is a live electrical uh, source and so you wouldn't want to put anything on that source that would bridge the gap between that fire and you electrically speaking that would take a terrible scenario and put it into an even worse scenario co2 doesn't conduct uh, and it will replace but it will replace the oxygen in the air so uh, might cause suffocation like I said you're gonna have to have some kind of self-contained breathing apparatus uh, or ventilation into the area brazing and soldering use a press regulator on the nitrogen cylinder and a relief valve you gotta do that breathing nitrogen through that system while you're brazing uh, displaces the oxygen so you don't get that oxidation inside of uh, the line set wear proper eye uh, protection and skin protection avoid breathing the vapors a lot of times we don't even think about that all this stuff that we're breathing breathing put off a certain amount of vapors that we could be breathing in have long-term side effects uh, avoid prolonged skin contact with the different fluxes don't pressurize a system with oxygen or air uh, it's got to be some kind of a inert gas like uh, like nitrogen never look at the gauge on a pressure cylinder as you open the cylinder okay? and typically your safety zone is going to be off to the side of a regulator not in front because that's where your hoses are going to be uh, typically uh, set at and then you're also going to have your pop-off front of the, the gauges that would be a weak spot and then behind oftentimes is going to be your pop-off so off to the side is going to be your safety zone or your comfort zone 
use only good uh, good hoses. Uh, don't use hoses that have been burnt or cut uh, or repaired. Open the acetylene tank a quarter to a half turn. Leave the wrench valve on or the wrench on the valve the whole time that you're brazing so that you can turn it off quickly if things go sideways. Always turn the fuel or the acetylene on or off first. Okay, so it's going to be the first on, then you light. It's going to be the last off. Secure the tanks with an approved hand cart or carrier during the transportation by securing most DOT uh, or commercial vehicle enforcement. Uh, guys want you to secure that with a strap, not with a bungee cord. A ratcheting strap. Handling of refrigerants. Always wear the appropriate safety attire, like gloves and eye protection, uh, things like that. Never expose a cylinder to open flames. Always open a cylinder valve slowly. Don't fill a recovery cylinder beyond 80% of its rated capacity. Don't use any cylinders that have any kind of damage or rust to them. Don't drop or hit the cylinders with a hammer. They could still have pressure on them. It could be dangerous. Thanks a lot for joining me. Uh, on this core service review, you've completed the second part of it. Uh, again, feel free to go back through any of this stuff um, for review in the future if you need to. Many other um, tests that are out there in the industry can be studied for using this material. Uh, if you can pass one like the Nate exam, which is considered to be one of the tougher ones, you should have a pretty good uh, chance at passing the rest of them as well. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you around.